In this recording, I'm going to investigate the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared dx. I plan to show the result here, that the value is root pi over 2. In this particular recording, my main motivation for doing this is as an exercise showing a rather useful application of double integrals. However, it turns out that the function e to the minus x squared and its integral occurs commonly not only in statistics but also in areas of physics where statistical processes are, are at play. Areas such as the diffusion of a gas throughout a space, for instance, or the diffusion of heat throughout a medium. For that reason, this is a very important function, and its integral is important also. For that reason also, this maths cast will act as an initial maths cast in a series which will discuss e to the minus x squared and its integral and prove a number of results concerning this function. For the moment though, let's just stick with proving the value of the integral as shown here. To begin with, let's talk about the integral without the limits on, just integral of e to the negative x squared dx. Rather inconveniently, it turns out that we can't write this integral in terms of elementary functions such as sine, cos, exponential or log. It just can't be done. The result we're interested in, though, is a bit different. It's a definite integral. It has limits on it. It turns out there is a way to prove the value of this integral. So let's get on with it. First of all, I don't really want to keep writing out this integral, so let's give it a name. Let's write i equals integral 0 to infinity e to the minus x squared dx. I'm going to do something that will seem a little bit strange and illogical at first sight. At the moment, as it stands, I have no idea how to, how to uh, evaluate that integral. Instead, I'm going to look at i squared. And just write out, naively, i multiplied by i. OK, well, that seems to have made the problem worse, not better. But actually, this is the key to the whole evaluation. If we can evaluate i squared, then of course we can take the square root and we should get an answer for i. The secret in, lies in recognising the fact that here the name x is irrelevant. x is a dummy variable or variable of integration. In the end, if we could do this integral, we would simply be substituting values for x. So the name x really didn't matter. We could have called it anything. I'm going to take the second integral in this product and write it in terms of a new name, y, instead. It won't change the value of i squared. OK, there we are. Now, in this integration, x and y are completely independent of each other. They don't affect each other, and what's more, the integration limits contain only constants no functions of x or y. That means that it's quite a valid thing to do to write this as a double integral with the two integrands next to each other and over a region in the xy plane. Let's go one step further and simplify that exponential by combining the powers OK, so now, a double integral over a region in the xy plane. What region would that be? Well, x has to run from 0 to infinity, and y also has to run from 0 to positive infinity. That means we're integrating over the whole of the first quadrant in the xy plane. All right, well, that's all very well and good. But it's no good if we can't actually do the integration still. Now comes the really clever thing. Why don't we change x and y to polar coordinates? Let x be r cos theta and y r sine theta. That's a familiar process and we should know then that x squared plus y squared turns into r squared and, importantly, 
dx dy turns into r dr d theta, but there's an extra factor known as the Jacobian. It's a factor of r that sits there. We can now start to write out our integrals. i squared is, I'll talk about the limits in a minute, e to the minus, it was x squared plus y squared, but that's r squared, r dr d theta. There's an inner integral and an outer one. Now what about those limits? Well, imagine a point in the xy plane with coordinates in polars r and theta. It's at an angle theta and a distance r. To cover the whole of the first quadrant, we need theta to start at theta equals zero, that's the x-axis, and run as far as the y-axis, which has theta equal to pi by two. So that must be our limits for our theta integral. As far as r is concerned, it starts at the origin, and if we want to cover the whole quadrant, we must just go on indefinitely to infinity in every direction. So r still runs from zero to infinity. We've now got a double integral that we can do. The substitution u equals r squared will allow us to actually evaluate the r part. Okay, u equals r squared. So du is 2r dr. And so r times dr is the same as a half du. So we'll now rewrite everything i squared is, we'll keep the theta integral for the moment, we'll worry about that at the end, and the r part has now become the integral e to the minus u times one half du. As for the limits, well, u equals r squared, so when r is zero, u is also zero, and when r gets big, u also gets very big. So the limits are just the same finish off with a d theta on the end there. Now the inner integral is easy to perform. Let's leave the outer one intact for the moment. Let's get the half out of the way. We just get minus e to the minus u to be evaluated from zero to infinity and still the theta integral to finish. Now an infinity on an integration limit carries with it the idea that it's a large limit that's tending to infinity. When we put a large thing into e to the minus u, we get something very small. And then the limit that the, the argument of the exponential becomes large and negative and tends to infinity, then e to the minus that value tends to zero. So the substitution of infinity into this uh, integrand simply gives us zero. The bottom limit, zero, we'll make e to the zero, which is one. There's a negative in front of it already, but there's a second negative that arises because it's the lower integration limit. That means we'll get plus a half, and we can still leave the half outside. So actually we just get one d theta. Well, the rest is now trivial. That's just a half theta from zero to pi by two and substitution of the limits gives pi by 4. So we've discovered that i squared equals pi by 4, and hence i is root pi over 2, taking square root. So our conclusion is the integral from 0 to infinity e to the minus x squared dx is root pi by 2. I should probably just comment that I deliberately ignored the negative square root minus root pi by 2, because after all e to the negative x squared is a positive quantity. Integration is just adding up amounts of e to the minus x squared. If you add up positive things, you've got to end up with something positive. The graph of e to the minus x squared is above the x-axis everywhere. So we chose the positive root. I've now proved the result that I wanted. I rest my case.